name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good morning. This is Pastor Tim Miller. I'm privileged to serve St. John's Lutheran Church, New Minden, St. Luke's Covington, and Trinity St. John Lutheran School in Nashville. Thank you so much for tuning into our Bible class. The Bible is indeed the book of love, the Jesus book, as those second graders sang a few years ago from Trinity St. John School. Today we'll open the Bible again to continue our study of the book of Luke. Let's begin with a prayer. Eternal God, your Son Jesus Christ is our true Sabbath rest. Help us to keep each day holy by receiving his word of comfort that we may find our rest in him who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Last week in Luke chapter 5, we heard how Jesus called Levi the tax collector, also known as Matthew, to be his disciple. Levi then invites all his friends and throws a banquet in honor of Jesus. The Pharisees don't like this at all, that Jesus is dining with them, but Jesus has an answer for them. He says, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I've not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Jesus also answered their complaint about his disciples eating and drinking instead of fasting. This week, we'll see that he has answers for still more complaints from the Pharisees. We begin with chapter 6, verse 1. On a Sabbath, while he was going through the grain fields, his disciples plucked and ate some heads of grain, rubbing them in their hands. But some of the Pharisees said, Why are you doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath? Perhaps you've done this yourself when the wheat is ripe or nearly ripe. You pluck the kernels, rub them in your hands, and then pour them from one hand to the other so that the wind will blow the chaff away. Finally, you put the kernels in your mouth and begin to chew. After a while, you have something like chewing gum in your mouth. The Pharisees jumped on this and confronted Jesus about it. Such snacking along the way was not considered stealing. Deuteronomy 23 says, If you go into your neighbor's standing grain, you may pluck the ears with your hands, but you shall not put a sickle to your neighbor's standing grain. In those days when people traveled on foot, farmers were supposed to leave some grain standing along the edges of the field so that travelers would have something to sustain them and the poor could find something to eat. Leviticus 23 says, And when you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap your field right up to its edge, nor shall you gather the gleanings after your harvest. You shall leave them for the poor and for the sojourner. I am the Lord your God. No, the complaint here was not about stealing. The Pharisees are complaining that the disciples are breaking the Sabbath day, the day of rest. It was Saturday when this happened. And to be sure, in the Old Testament, we do hear God's command to his people Israel, Observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter or your male servant or your female servant or your ox or your donkey or any of your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates, that your male servant and your female servant may rest as well as you. Deuteronomy 5. The Pharisees were determined not to break the Sabbath day, so they set up a hedge of man-made laws around it, just to make sure that the commandment was not broken. And according to the Pharisaic regulations, reaping was one of 39 types of work forbidden on the Sabbath. By plucking those few heads of wheat, the disciples were guilty of reaping on the day of rest. Throughout the years, various Christian groups have required a day of rest each week, usually on the first day of the week, though some still celebrate it on Saturday. But is that all there is to the Sabbath day? I'm reminded of the old blue laws that used to be in effect, which required stores to close all day Sunday. Such a law only works when everybody shuts down on Sundays. When Don and I moved to St. Louis in 1983, that was the law in the state of Missouri. And what I remember most about that was that on Sunday afternoons, there was a huge traffic jam on the Illinois side with Missouri people coming to the mall to go shopping. 
Eventually, the merchants on the Missouri side got tired of all that business going across the river, and the law was changed. While the law was in effect, are we to suppose that a greedy merchant in St. Louis, sitting at home grumbling on a Sunday afternoon, that he was keeping the Sabbath? He wasn't going to work. He was ceasing what he did the rest of the week, but this surely is not what the Sabbath day is all about. And of course, common sense tells us that it is good to take a day off from your work every week. It's part of our stewardship of this body and mind that God has given to us. It really relates to the commandment, you shall not murder. That is, don't kill yourself with work. To work seven days a week, week after week, month after month, is a sure way to be asking for a breakdown of some sort, either physically or mentally. And surely the Lord's commandments against coveting come into play here as well. If our motivation to skip a day off is merely to get rich, there should be warning flags going off in our conscience. But to require everybody to stop working on a certain day, be it Saturday or Sunday, is not what this commandment is all about. How many of us are planning to go out to eat on Sunday noon? Guess what? Sunday morning, right now, people are hard at work so that when you get to the restaurant, you can have something to eat. And what about our emergency personnel? More than once at St. John's, we've had the EMTs come right down the aisle in church during the Sunday morning worship service to help someone having a medical crisis. Surely they're helping in healing work, like the work of Jesus on the Sabbath, as we will see, is pleasing to the Lord. But make no mistake about it, it is work. The Pharisees tried to get rid of their unrest to ease their consciences by convincing themselves that they were better than others. That is why they were so quick to condemn Jesus and his disciples. Why are you doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath? Jesus will point out to them that they are missing out on the true rest that God gives as long as they're trying to justify themselves. To justify yourself brings endless toil and unrest. People often want to use this commandment to condemn others. We sinners are so quick to mess up and distort the good things that God gives. Take work, for example. Work is a good thing. Even before Adam and Eve fell into sin, they had work to do. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it, it says, Genesis chapter 2. There was nothing ornery about that work until after the curse of sin, when thorns and thistles came. Even today, we should be honored that God uses our work to provide daily bread for ourselves and our children, and that he uses our work to bless our neighbor with good things. But how we distort the good gifts of God. On the one hand, there is the temptation to laziness and sloth. There are many capable people who rob their employer by not putting in the time and effort that they're being paid to do. Or they're too lazy to go out and find a job or to keep it. On the other hand, there's the temptation to overwork. There are some for whom work is their whole life. Everything else is a distant second. It becomes a sort of a God, and we begin to trust in ourselves, looking to ourselves and our own work ethic to take care of us and provide us if we just work hard enough. We forget he's the one who gives us body and mind and health and cleverness and opportunities to make a living. And greed can have a part in distorting work also. Instead of working to serve our neighbor, we get carried away and simply work, work, work. As a result of overwork, relationships suffer, marriages fail, and stress ruins health. Overwork does not lead to peace. And then to top it all off, these two groups try to find peace and to soothe their consciences by saying, well, at least I'm not like those others. The workaholics say, at least I'm not a lazy good-for-nothing like so-and-so. And the lazy say, they're just working so hard because they're greedy. How quickly and easily we become like the Pharisees. I thank you, God, that I am not like so-and-so. But none of this is what the Sabbath day is really all about. Jesus' response teaches us the true meaning of the Sabbath day. Verses 3 to 5. And Jesus answered them, Have you not read what David did when he was hungry, he and those who were with him? How he entered the house of God and took and ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for any but the priests to eat, and also gave it to those with him. And he said to them, The Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. 
As he did so often, Jesus answers complaints by directing people to read their Bibles. Go back to 1 Samuel 21, he says, when David was on the run being chased by King Saul. The priest gave him some of the bread from the holy place near the altar of incense in the tabernacle. That bread was called literally the bread of the face because it was in that place where God himself had promised to be present. Twelve loaves were to be prepared each Sabbath day according to strict specifications and set out on a special table, Exodus 25. After sitting out for a week, these loaves were to be given only to Aaron, the high priest, and his sons, Leviticus 24. Yet David and his men, when they were hungry, not starving, but hungry, were given some by the priest to sustain them. Jesus is teaching us that mercy and caring for people's needs was always intended to trump outward conformity to the requirements of the ceremonial laws. And the Sabbath day was a ceremonial law. So what is the Sabbath day really all about? It's all about Jesus. Jesus said the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. This tells us that not only was Jesus the giver of the Sabbath as the Son of God giving the law to Israel on Mount Sinai, not only is he the boss and interpreter of the Sabbath day, Jesus is the fulfillment of the Sabbath day. Jesus himself is our Sabbath rest. This is made very clear in Colossians chapter 2. Therefore let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. These are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. So the substance of the Sabbath day is Christ himself. The day of rest under Old Testament law was just a shadow of the true rest that we have in Jesus. A shadow is not the real thing, but it is shaped something like the real thing, and it always leads up to the real thing. So as we study the Bible's teachings about the Sabbath rest, we should think of Christ. In Christ, we have someone who has done our work for us. We don't have to try to work our way to salvation. We couldn't do it anyway. What a horrible slavery it would be to try to live such a good life that God would have to love us. You couldn't do it. Our work would never be finished. We'd be living under a horrible taskmaster. No, with regard to working out our salvation, Jesus, the Lord of the Sabbath, says to us, take it easy. Stop fretting. Just rest. Retire. Set a spell. I have done it all for you. When Jesus died on the cross, he said, it is finished. Not, now it is your turn to work. The resurrection of Jesus from the dead demonstrates that God the Father is indeed well pleased with the work that Jesus accomplished. He fully atoned for our sin. Take a look at Dr. Luther's small catechism. When explaining the commandment to remember the Sabbath day, it says nothing about stopping work. Instead, it says we should fear and love God that we do not despise preaching in his word, but hold it sacred and gladly hear and learn it. You see, Sabbath and rest are practically synonymous with peace. God wanted his people to have rest in their souls, and true rest comes from hearing the gospel of Jesus. We are free to worship on any day, but the long-standing practice of the church is to gather on the first day of the week because that's the day when Jesus rose from the dead. And the risen Savior says to us, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Matthew 11. That is why it is so important to hear the word of God often. Without the good news of Jesus, we so easily fall into the trap of thinking that we can work our way back to God. And there's an old instructive hymn that explains the Ten Commandments. When it sings of the Sabbath day, it says, You shall observe the worship day, that peace may fill your home, and pray, and put aside the work you do, so that God may work in you. Have mercy, Lord. Worship is simply taking time in the Word of God so that God may do His work in us. 
This is how God will give us peace. When we hold the word of God sacred and gladly hear and learn it, and God works in us through that word. And even for those Old Testament people, the Sabbath was to be more than simply a 24-hour work stoppage. It was to have spiritual meaning. It was to bring to mind God's goodness to them in rescuing them from Egypt. Deuteronomy 5 says, You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. For many years they had toiled as slaves under their taskmasters in Egypt. They probably went years without having a single day off. But when God brought them out of Egypt, that all changed. They were free people who could set their own hours. They were able to give their bodies rest and to gather together weekly to reflect on the salvation that God had given them. In Jesus, our Sabbath rest, we are free. We are no longer slaves under the ordinary requirements of the law, but people set free by God's Son to live under God in joy and peace forever. Well, let's take a moment and hear a song about how Jesus has taken all our burdens upon himself. It's called Cast Thy Burden and is based on Psalm 55, especially these verses. And I say, oh, that I had wings like a dove, I would fly away and be at rest. Yes, I would wander far away. I would lodge in the wilderness. I would hurry to find a shelter from the raging wind and tempest. But I call to God and the Lord will save me. Evening and morning and at noon, I utter my complaint and moan, and he hears my voice. He redeems my soul in safety. Cast your burden on the Lord and he will sustain you. He will never permit the righteous to be moved. So here is Cast Thy Burden, sung by the ongoing Ambassadors for Christ. Cast the light burden upon the Lord, and He shall sustain thee. He shall never suffer the righteous to be moved. Cast thy burden upon the Lord, and he shall sustain thee. He shall never suffer the righteous to be moved. As for me, I will call upon God. shall never suffer the righteous to be moved. As for me, I will call upon God, and the Lord shall save me. Evening and morning, shall never suffer the righteous to be moved. And now the chapter continues with another Sabbath controversy. Luke 6, beginning at verse 6. On another Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and was teaching, and a man was there whose right hand was withered. And the scribes and the Pharisees watched him to see whether he would heal on the Sabbath so that they might find a reason to accuse him. But he knew their thoughts, and he said to the man with the withered hand, Come and stand here. 
And he rose and stood there. And Jesus said to them, I ask you, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save life or to destroy it? And after looking around at them all, he said to them, stretch out your hand. And he did so, and his hand was restored. Well, we've heard that the Sabbath was a reminder of the Lord, Israel's redeemer out of slavery in Egypt. The Sabbath is also a reminder of the Creator. At Mount Sinai, God added this statement, For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Exodus 20. How fitting, then, that Jesus restored the withered hand of that poor man on the Sabbath day. Jesus gave him a little taste of the new creation, the complete restoration of all things to which we are looking forward on the last day. Of course, it's not fitting to do harm to other people or to destroy life on the Sabbath, but to do good and restore life is most fitting. How could they condemn Jesus for restoring this man's life on the Sabbath? Scripture tells us that God will make new heavens and a new earth, a whole new creation to replace this broken one to be destroyed by fire. This new creation will be the home of righteousness. The Bible speaks of it as the time for restoring all the things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets long ago. Acts 3. As we gather in God's house on the Lord's day and receive the forgiveness of sins and the Holy Spirit works in us, we are receiving a down payment on the complete restoration that God has in store for us, yes, also for these mortal bodies. And there is rest for our loved ones in the presence of Christ as soon as they die. In Revelation 14, John writes, And I heard a voice from heaven saying, Write this, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Blessed indeed, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, for their deeds follow them. Those who die in the Lord, that is, with faith in him, are blessed. They're in a happy condition, people saved by the Lord Jesus. Death cannot rob them of life and peace. They're in the hands of their good shepherd, John 10. When God gave the people of Israel victory and a war was over, we read that the land had rest. You see that in Judges and Joshua, for example. God has given us rest in the victory of Jesus Christ over our enemies. In the battle against our sinful flesh, for example, the victory is ours. Romans 7, Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. We taste that victory over these enemies now as we live in the forgiveness of our sins and receive strength from the Holy Spirit to resist temptation. The best will come when Jesus returns and these mortal bodies are raised immortal, when these sin-filled bodies are remade in the image of Jesus Christ himself. No wonder King David could say, My flesh also shall rest in hope. Psalm 16. Remember Jesus, the Lord of the Sabbath, came for the very purpose of reversing the curses of sin. We heard it in his sermon at Nazareth in Luke chapter 4. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Well, the section closes with the opposition plotting against Jesus, Luke 6, verse 11, but they were filled with fury and discussed with one another what they might do to Jesus. We were informed at the start that the Pharisees were already looking for reasons to have Jesus put to death. The scribes and Pharisees were watching him in the synagogue for that very purpose of finding a reason to accuse him. That's legal jargon for saying they're already wanting to find some charge against Jesus that they could make stick before the Jewish court. They knew he was in the habit of healing on the Sabbath day, and by their reckoning, if you were a healer, if that was your work and you were doing it on the Sabbath day, you were breaking the Sabbath. Jesus' Sabbath miracles infuriate the Pharisees and spur them on in their plotting to get rid of him. In reality, they were condemning Jesus for doing good. Peter had this in mind when he wrote, for it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. 1 Peter 3. 
Looking backwards, we can see five controversies in a row that involved the Pharisees, that criticized Jesus for forgiving the sins of the paralyzed man, for dining with tax collectors, for not having his disciples do more fasting, for plucking grain and healing on the Sabbath. Each of these involve things central to Christian worship, the forgiveness of sins pronounced here on earth, table fellowship with our Lord, and the true Sabbath rest that begins now and lasts forever. Well, here is one more item that Jesus takes care of, recorded in Luke 6, verses 12 to 16. In these days he went out to the mountain to pray, and all night he continued in prayer to God. And when day came, he called his disciples and chose from them twelve, whom he named apostles, Simon, whom he named Peter, and Andrew his brother, and James and John, and Philip and Bartholomew, and Matthew and Thomas and James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon, who was called the Zealot, and Judas the son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. No doubt Jesus' all-night prayer session with the Father included extensive prayers about these 12 men, each of them about to be called as apostles, that is, sent ones. Luke uses this term apostle more than the other gospel writers, and he's the only one who specifically tells us that it was Jesus who used this term for them. And later he will say to them, after he rose, as the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you, John 20. He prays for them while it is dark, so that when daylight comes, he might commission them. In the future, he will pray for them in their hour of darkness, so that they might again see the light. All who are named here will abandon Jesus in his hour of need, but all except Judas will be restored. We can be sure that Jesus is praying for us, whom he also sends out into this dark world, sends us out to proclaim the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. 1 Peter 2. The word we share is the word of Christ, recorded under the authority of his apostles in the New Testament. Let's pray the Lord's Prayer, led in song by the children from Trinity St. John Lutheran School, accompanied by Mrs. Janice Lange. Receive the benediction of our Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. You've been listening to the Bible study from St. John's Lutheran Church, New Minden. This is Pastor Tim Miller. Please join us next Sunday, God willing, as we continue our study of Luke. These studies are also available at stjohnsnewminden.org. You can find a manuscript there as well. Just click on Radio Archives and the date. If you do not have a church home, we invite you to join us sinners at St. John's, where the gifts of Christ's forgiveness and salvation are offered every Saturday at 6.30 p.m. and every Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. My wife Dawn and I have sponsored this broadcast to the glory of God and in thanksgiving for the life and work of my brother Herb, a faithful witness to Jesus Christ who was called home to heaven one year ago today, March 21st. Thanks to our partners at WNSV 1047, and thank you for listening. Please stay tuned for worship from our sister congregation, Trinity Lutheran Church, Nashville. <laughs>